Thank you to our Wind Ensemble for reminding us that God's with us in every moment. And I encourage you, get your hymn book, make it a part of your daily devotional life, learn these songs, and then when we're hearing them musically presented, be blessed by the words that go through your head. And they will and they do. And in some of our hardest and darkest moments, these, this, these are gospel songs. These are deep theological uh, expositions of a musical composition. Let's pray. Lord, we're here to celebrate your goodness, to be reminded of your faithfulness, and to go forward in courage. So bless me now, Lord. May I be prompted by the Spirit. May all of us be prompted by the same Spirit. And may we move forward as you lead us to our heavenly home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I believe that God is doing a special work in the hearts of his people. And I believe that there is to be a final generation and that it is either our job to prepare that generation or to be that generation. I don't believe it can be long until Jesus returns because the earth is racked in the throes of godless leadership and godless culture. And I'm convinced that the most exciting thing in the world would be to be God's instrument in those final hours because when God comes down and does something, it's amazing. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, I believe, is a divine preparation for our last day generation. Isaiah 59. And I want to encourage you to remember that Isaiah 58 comes before it, which is a call to minister to the hurting, the heartbroken, the homeless. It's a call to repentance, Isaiah 58 is. Cry aloud and spare not, the Bible says. Raise your voice like a trumpet. But in Isaiah 51, 59, that is, verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. Now, there's, the Bible will be an inexhaustible source of study, reflection, and rejoicing throughout all time, but I want to go beginning with verse 15. And I'm going to start in the second half of verse 15. There is a phrase that says, now the Lord saw. What did he see? He saw that truth was lacking, and anybody who turns aside from evil, the beginning of the verse says, makes himself a prey. It sounds like today's modern culture. Stand up for what's right and you can be mobbed or sidelined or canceled. Uh, you can be cyber bullied or physically bullied. It says, now the Lord saw and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. All right, now I want to remember the chapter starts saying out, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save and his ear not so dull that it cannot hear. And he's listening and he's looking and he says there's a problem here. Anybody that does what's right makes himself into a target. And the Lord was, dis was dismayed that there was no one to intercede. Now the rest of verse 16. Then his own arm brought salvation to him and his righteousness upheld him. Now I want you to notice the pronouns. So this is him. This is his. Now it's going to go to he. Verse 17. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal like a mantle. And this is what he said. According to their deeds, so he will repay Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, and to the coastlands he will make recompense. Now, I appreciate my version of the Bible up here, the New American Standard, but I'm not exactly excited about this next verse as it reads here, but I'm going to read it how they've translated it. It says, So they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Now, just get the picture. 
God is looking down at the earth and he says, anybody who follows me and does what's right is a prey. And he says, I'm going to put on the armor. I'm going to go down and fight the battle. Now, in verse 19, the last part of it, according to the King James Version, says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up what? Standard. Now, a standard is a flag. And a flag is for an army. Now, the reason I don't really believe the New American Standard gets the translation right here is because all the verses before talk about Jesus putting on his armor. Now, I want to tell you, in the last days, Jesus is going to general the work directly. Jesus led them on an exodus journey. He was the rock, Paul will write in 1 Corinthians. Jesus, he was the cloud. Jesus himself, at the end of time, is going to lead an amazing battle between right and wrong on a journey out of this world to our heavenly Canaan. Amen? That's what's happening. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord himself is going to come down wearing his armor and raise up a standard. Now, this morning, I can tell you that as, as a young man, I did not want to follow God's call in my life to be a pastor. And part of it was because even back in the 80s, when I was in those developmental years thinking about my life, I could see that so much of what went on with the church was kind of second rate and leftovers. I can remember in my first district, a lady bought a new chair for her house, and she gave us the old one, and I was offended. God doesn't want your leftovers. And I don't mean that bad. But that's part of the reason I didn't want to choose to be a minister is because the levels of commitment by many. Now, the older generation that was serving had kept the church alive, and I want to praise the Lord for those seniors. Can I hear an amen? Where would we be without the men and the women who have some life education in God? I pray for these older men and women that God will lengthen their lives. I don't even want to think about not having them around to give counsel and encouragement. But I'm afraid that so many of our young people look at what's going on and it, it doesn't look like the noble, well-disciplined, well-financed, well-unified, well-prayed-over succeeding army going from victory to victory. I'm afraid they look at it and it looks like it's a sinking ship. And you know what the old adage is, even rats abandon a sinking ship. And for me, making the decision to follow Jesus, to become a part of the leadership of this institution, it was very off-putting. And I could see the honor that would come to other occupations and of course, some of those were built around their education, and some were built around the amount of money they made, and some were built around the amount of influence they had. But I knew God was calling me to what I was doing. But I always longed in my heart that I would see and experience what the early Adventist church experienced, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the victories, the glorious affirmation from God that you were doing the right thing. I think about the, the sanitariums that came up, and I think about men like Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and the presidents and the movie stars and the rich people that made their way to Battle Creek to learn what God taught that man. And I, I, even my father-in-law, who is now resting in Jesus, as a younger man worked in the hydrotherapy department, therapy department of the sanitarium. And you know, what they had done was so cutting edge, and it wasn't because John Harvey Kellogg was smart, although I'm sure he was, but it's because Ellen White says effectively that an angel stood by his side and taught him most of what he knew. I want you to think about this. It's the excellence of God in our midst that makes us stand out from the crowd and 
It was my hope that, you know, I, I heard these back when the Dime Tabernacle was built, this very large church in Battle Creek that unfortunately has burned to the ground. 3,000 plus people in there and half of the church would be singing Never Part Again. And, and that's an antiphonal song and they sing, No, Never Part Again. And then the, the crowd on the other half, can you imagine 15, 1,600 people responding, No, Never Part Again. And, and I think about these amazing missionaries that we had And, and you couldn't stop what God was doing in his remnant church. And it spread around the globe, almost like the apostolic movement. In about a generation, we were in so many countries. And our young people, some of the smartest, brightest, most noble young men and women signing up to serve God, laying down their lives, becoming doctors and teachers and lawyers and nurses and engineers and advancing God's cause. And I I thought to myself, what would it be to be a part of that? <laughs> And today, I'm here to tell you, I think God is starting it up again. I had somebody sit in the committee room yesterday with me whose very life is an expose of God plucking him out of all call the swirling cesspool of corporate America making tons of money and kind of proud about himself and God plucking him out and saying to him, son, I've got a higher call on your life. And now the way he's serving. You know, uh, this morning, a few minutes ago, uh, one of, uh, Corey Bush was up here. Do you understand how God is bringing together his people. I mean, in the beginning, 10 years ago, unfortunately, this church had kind of fallen into physical disrepair. And we needed a contractor. And the unfortunate thing is when a congregation falls into physical disrepair, it falls into financial disrepair too. And it's hard to say, is it the chicken or the egg? And do you know that, I don't think he'd mind me saying this, he's probably listening. Do you know that He became the contractor that started the journey with us to remodel this place. And do you know, it was hanging in the balance of just a few hundred dollars on a $200,000, almost $200,000 project that got that company merged in here. And then if you listen to him tell his story, let him talk to you about being a nominal Seventh-day Adventist and how God started moving on his heart. I'm here to tell you, friends, it's happening over and over and over again. And I'm watching the Spirit of God starting to move on people's hearts to understand not only the time in which we are living, but the glory of being used by God. This is what is happening. Yesterday I sat in Dr. John Kelly's home with, with three other doctors and two other pastors and, and listening to the stories of what God is doing to revive his church. And how is he doing it? He's bringing us back to the seminal or the starting significant DNA of what makes us a people. And I'm here to tell you, friends, you don't want to miss out on the Advent movement when it starts moving again. But I'm telling you, it's starting to move. And I want to show you how it works And I want to testify, I could spend two or three hours, I'm going to be very timely in what I do here this morning, but I'm here to tell you, when Moses thought he was ready to lead them out of the promised land, or into the promised land, he was not. As a matter of fact, he killed an Egyptian, he had the best education there was, and it was an education that actually had to be undone, and as a sub group of people in America and around the world right now, Seventh-day Adventists have some of the best educated subculture that exists on the face of the planet. But I'm afraid the education we've gotten looks and acts a little bit too much like the rest of the world. And what we need to get is the simple faith in God to take our best professionalism and all of our experience and, and set it humbly at the foot of the cross to say, Lord, I'll use it if you want me to, but if it looks like what you're calling me to do is in defiance of what I know, I'm going to follow you anyway. And I value and praise the Lord 
for the amazing giftedness of our people across the spectrums, what some of these folks can do and how powerfully they can think. But what's even more beautiful is watching God's people come together in sweetness and harmony. I'm here to tell you, Wednesday night, I asked this congregation that was here at prayer meeting, I'm inviting you all to be at prayer meeting, although there won't be a prayer meeting this Wednesday night, but it'd be nice if in your own homes, gather together and do a little thanking God. It is Thanksgiving the next day after this Wednesday. But this prayer meeting, at the end of the prayer meeting, I said to the people gathered here, I need you to pray. I have a problem so big, I can't fix it. And I want to tell you, it was probably the biggest problem I've faced in my pastoral life. And I can't tell you what it is, but I can tell you this. The next day, God fixed it in a miraculous way. And the outcome of that fixed prayer will be an amazing, amazing blessing that I will never be able to fully explain this side of heaven. But I want you to know something. God is putting on his armor He sees the enemies come in like a flood, and he's getting ready to come down himself and take charge of the battle, but he's asking us to get in a little bit of discipline, military discipline, as it were, a little bit of a lot more togetherness and a lot more focusedness. That's what God is calling us to do, because he's getting ready to lead a mighty movement again. I'm here to tell you, Moses wasn't ready. He killed the Egyptian. And he had to run for his life because God wasn't going to use Moses' education to lead Israel. And Moses wasn't going to be the leader. He was just going to be the face in the mouth. He goes 40 years in the wilderness. And towards the end of that 40 years, he sees a strange thing. Something's on fire on the side of Mount Sinai. Mount Horeb is another name for it. And as he starts approaching, he gets close enough to see it's a bush, but It's not going away. You know, deserts are dry and things burn fast and this isn't extinguishing itself. And when it gets closer, God says, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. He takes his shoes off. He gets close. God starts talking to him. He says, I've heard the cry of my people. Listen, friends, God is allowing some bad things to come on this earth so we can see Egypt isn't heaven. Heaven is still across the spiritual Jordan. There's terrible things happening around us. God is allowing us to see that we're really slaves here no matter how good it is and that the future isn't getting brighter. And he says, I've heard the cry of my people. And by the way, friends, this Seventh-day Adventist church is to echo the announcement of gospel glory, forgiveness of sins, healing to mind, body, and soul. And he's calling us to be a part of answering that. God's listening. He hears the cry of all the anguish on the earth. And he says, Moses, you need to go back. And Moses says, me? They're not going to listen to me. They hate me there. He says, stick your hand inside your robe. Pull it out. The worst case of leprosy he's ever seen. Stick your hand back in. Pull it out. The most beautiful, youthful skin on an 80-year-old you've ever seen. You see that rod? Throw it on the ground. It's a snake. Now grab it by the worst place you could ever grab a deadly desert adder by the tail. It's a rod again. Why'd God do that for Moses? Why? So Moses could know God could do anything, and if he's sending him to Egypt... It'll be okay. He gets down there. We know there's miracles. How about for those Israelites? They were excited about a deliverer until they didn't have straw to make bricks with. And then what'd they want to do? They wanted to wring Moses' neck. They had three manifestations. There were 10 plagues. The first three did not fall on them. I should say... None of them really fell on them, but the last seven especially were powerful and painful. The first three did not fall on the land of Goshen. And what happened was, was that God started showing his people what he could do to deliver them. Finally, it comes night number, plague number nine. 
And God says, slay the lamb and put blood on the doorpost. Don't go outside. This is it. I'm about to deliver you. They're going to throw you out of this country. They're not just going to ask you to go. And that night, all of the firstborn die in Egypt unless they're protected by the blood. Nobody needed to die. Only the proud, only the stiff-necked. They leave Israel with all of this jewelry and money, the Egypt. And God directs them right straight toward the Red Sea. God knew they were headed toward the Red Sea. It was God that led them to the Red Sea. They get all the way up to the Red Sea and they're there for a little while and then they can see the glimmer of the sun off the shields and the swords of the Egyptian army as it approaches them. Moses says, Lord, what are you doing? And God says, why are you calling out to me? And he gave a two-word response. Go forward. Now, why did God do all those things for Israel? So that when they came up to the bitter waters, they wouldn't complain. And so when they ran out of water at Mount Sinai, they'd call out to God instead of call out and grumbling and complaining. Food on the desert floor, shade by day, warm by night. What was God doing? He was preparing them to go into the promised land. Courage for the exodus was courage for the conquest, which was to be the fulfillment of the promise. When God goes to start the Advent movement moving again, he's going to do the same thing. He's going to give evidence of his presence. And as he gives evidence of his presence, faith is going to build And the momentum like a flywheel, God's going to take the flywheel and he's going to give it a divine spin. And all of a sudden, that divine locomotive that is sat kind of rusty on the rails is going to belch and sputter and come to life. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's going to come on God's people. And as Ellen White says, every blessing is behind that engine. Every blessing comes in the train of the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, we're going to see a final burst of glory for God, ideally through his church. We know there's going to be a shaking and many are going to go out and many are going to come in. But the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God restarting this work one more time. Listen, Abraham was his man in the Old Testament. God sought to redeem and restore many multiple times. Then Jesus comes himself, and as, after he has died, he has promised that what he will give his New Testament church will be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, friends. The apostasy that is working its way through some parts of this church in regards to the most amazing manifestation of God in our day is the power of the third person of the Godhead. Not an emanating spirit of God, but one of the three co-eternal persons. And the reason that that is, is working its way so powerfully through our church right now is that the devil knows this is the final instrumentality of the church's new life. And so we go from its Abrahamic beginnings to its apostolic restart to its Adventist final movement. And that, friends, is is the three movements of God for his church on earth. And we need to be preparing to receive the gift by actually letting it move on our hearts in advance so that when the rains come, the, the pre-showers that have refreshed the ground have it ready to receive the soil, as we heard about in our offering appeal, is ready to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White writes, the Lord is now dealing with his people who believe present truth. He designs to bring about momentous results. Emphasis on momentous. And while in his providence, he's working towards this end, he says to his people, go forward. True, she says, the path is not open yet. Hmm. But when they move, 
I'm going to say that again. When they move on in the strength of faith and courage, God will make the way plain before their eyes. There are ever those who will complain as did ancient Israel and charge the difficulties of their position upon those whom God has raised up for the special purpose of advancing his cause. They fail to see that God is testing them by bringing them into straight places from which there is no deliverance except by his hand. Did you catch that? No deliverance except by his hand. I'm here to tell you on Wednesday night when the prayer meeting group prayed, there was going to be no deliverance except by God's hand. And I want to tell you, we got it. And the few that understand the journey could stand here and say even more vehemently what I'm saying. Now, there's a few things that have to be in place. And I will tell you that I believe by God's grace the experience of this local church may be, could be, would be wonderful if it indeed turned out to be a catalyst for creating a little energy for the movement. Here's what she says in the ninth testimony. If ever the Lord has spoken by me, if you're a prophet and you use that kind of phrase for energy and, and exclamation point, then maybe what follows we ought to hear. If ever the Lord has spoken by me, he speaks when I say that the workers engaged in educational lines, in ministerial lines, and in medical missionary lines must stand as a unit. And all laboring under the supervision of God, one should be helping each other. It's not good. It's not good. It's not healthy for our kids to go through our schools and come out the other side and make all of this money and not know what to do with it. Some doctors, some engineers. It's not good for the church to watch what are supposed to be medical missionaries get so deliberately tempted by the devil with all the resources and the invitation to an easy, pleasant, convenient life. It's not good. No, the church needs its medical people not to take their medical resources from their great medical education and somehow drift from the teachers and the pastors. And it's not good for our education and its, its institutions to drift into the arms of worldly affirmation, doing things largely the way the world does it, without recognizing that the, the hand and the head are every bit as much about a divine education, the hand and the heart, as the head is. And it's not good for the pastors to allow themselves to descend at times into very unprofessional ways of living and doing, it's sad. Educators have to get continuing education and doctors have to get continuing education, but there's no worldly group out there that's going to say pastors have to get continuing education. You see the, the, the professionality and the spirituality and the unity of these three groups working together is the DNA of the Seventh-day Adventist Church from its earliest origins. And when that unity is lost, everybody suffers. And then you get to a place like we are right now where it's hard to get young people to be teachers and preachers. Doctors isn't such a stretch because you can go out and make two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year, whatever your specialty gives you or more. God intended that our teachers are missionaries. And God intended that our doctors are medical evangelists. And God intended that our preachers are spiritual men and women that can lead by faith with courage and professionality in the spirit of the Lord. I grew up at the bottom end of the middle class. I was asked two times to leave school. When I got into my ministry, 
It seemed like every church I got to didn't want to spend the little bit of money they had or didn't have any to spend. And the bigger the church, the less money they had. But I want to say to every denominational employee listening to me right now, if your institution doesn't have a budget, there is something you can give. You can give more of yourself, and God will honor it. The miracles that preceded the Exodus were the miracles that God's people needed to make the journey. Moses needed a different education, so God took him 40 years into the wilderness. And a lot of our very professional people, pastors, teachers, and doctors, and everybody else are going to need a little bit of a different education because what God's getting ready to do, nobody's getting any credit for except God. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Go ahead and open it. Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 8. They're getting ready to cross the Jordan. And by the way, God's going to send them across at flood time. On purpose. It's a Red Sea for them. Deuteronomy 8 verse 1, all the commandments that I'm commanding you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Jesus never intended that any of us shouldn't receive the inheritance. And what God wanted to do in the Old Testament was to make Israel a shining light through whom the whole world can be converted and his kingdom could come into reality. Didn't happen. Verse 2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you. It's too bad God could work such mighty manifestations and they would in their pride say, just let us go back to Egypt, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his commandments or not. He humbled you. And he let you be hungry, and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by what? Bread alone. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, and your feet did not swell these 40 years. I just want that to settle on you. Because as the Advent movement gets ready to move again, we may need some miracles like this again. Verse 5, thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks, of water, of fountains, of springs flowing forth in valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and figs and pomegranates. A land of olive oil, honey. A land where you will eat food without scarcity and in which you will not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. And when you've eaten and you're satisfied, you'll bless the Lord your God for the good land which he's given you. I'm here to tell you, friends, that was a symbol. That was a type The anti-type where the reality is upon us. He's going to take us all the way to heaven. We're going to live in a land where we never die. The streets are going to be gold. The atmosphere is going to be love. The beauty is going to be fellowship. The worship is going to be to God. Nobody's going to worry anymore. We're going to be home, home, home. This world's not your home. People getting sick and dying people losing the beauty of their person to diseases like dementia, people who were once young and strong and vibrant and committed, worn down by life. You have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight because when you say, go forward, God, and I can't see where the path's at, you're going to have to open it up. Now, I want to remind this church of a few things. God has blessed this congregation in every way. You're sitting in a beautiful church. The building is the least important of everything. There is by and large a sweet and harmonious spirit amongst this group. There is a missional focus of this group. There is a strong financial component of giving and commitment in this group. 
And there is a dedication to the ministries that both care for our own and care for those that may never choose Jesus in this group. I'm here to tell you that along the way, God has called us into moments where we had to decide how we were going to do things. Were we just going to focus on ourselves or were we going to let Jesus call us into a straight place where the only deliverance was going to be his? We have chosen as a church to focus on mission and the foreign mission at that. Not that we don't have local mission. We just had two marvelous days of local mission, praise the Lord. But I'm here to tell you something. About five years ago, we said to ourselves, we're not going to replace this roof just yet. We're going to keep doing some of our other things. And what we've done is we took care of something in the building and then went back and took care of somebody else that's not associated with us. Could be a church in another land. Could be wells in India. Could be any kind of thing. And after we do something for somebody else, we'll come back and we'll take care of our needs. And I want to tell you something. Not only did our roof not wear out in those years, but God gave us a new roof on the whole building. Praise the Lord. We had a shady technician come in here and tell us after lightning struck this building that he could make our organ work. The problem was he couldn't make it work. He jury-rigged it together, and for the next seven years, it would work most of the time and then not work when you needed it to. We had our fire system go out. We had parts of our sound system go out. What we didn't know was that it had ruined our organ, too. And when they took the back off it and they could see how it was jury rigged together, it's like, oh, we got a problem. And as you heard in the work up to the business meeting, God did with the insurance company what never happens. They honored a request to replace our organ even though it was seven years later. Two days ago, someone came to this clinic who didn't know they had a serious heart problem. Fortunately, Dr. Hess had brought his EKG machine, and fortunately, Dr. Markovic, who's a cardiologist, was here. And I want to tell you something. Somebody who didn't even know they were a walking time bomb found out because of the compassion of 170, upwards of 200 volunteers. And after they looked at that EKG, Dr. Markovic got on the phone and said, we need to make a place for this person to get in to see me. So I'm going to spend the rest of this message. Actually, I want to read one more quote to you. I'm going to spend the rest of this message trying to get you to see the signature of heaven. Now, a church can't go forward if its leaders don't know how to discern the will of God. They have to be in the word. They have to be willing to obey. And lots of churches aren't willing to obey. I'm here to tell you, lots of churches aren't willing to obey. You know why lots of churches won't obey? Because their leaders don't live like I'm about to describe. They live by sight, not by faith. And their commitment's to themselves first. And if it's inconvenient or scary, they won't do it. And the first thing they all ask themselves is, where are we going to get the money? And God specifically holds the money back until you start moving. Yes, you've got to be willing to obey. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to check yourself with some other people. The Bible says anybody who isolates himself rages against all sound wisdom. The Bible says there's wisdom in the multitude of the counselors. When you want to do what you want to do and you want God's stamp on it, just ignore what everybody else says. When you're really in God's will, you find a godly person and they'll affirm that you are. They'll tell you that you're not. And finally, after you think you are in God's will and you know his word and you've read the resources, maybe the spirit of prophecy or something else that can give you some direction, when you finally sense that you've got maybe a word of encouragement from a godly man or woman, and when that peace is in your heart and you actually do it, God shows up circumstantially to say, yes, you heard me right. I opened the way, now you know. And the next time, you have a little bit better ability to sense what he's saying. Learning to hear God's voice is the Abrahamic journey. It's mine, it's yours, and it's a group's. And when a church peoples itself and practices a culture that won't move by faith and only moves by sight, you get what we've got in Adventism. 
So you better find enough leaders who are willing to go on a journey. And if you got to start small, start small. That's how this church started. Small. But what happens is when God does something, you're supposed to acknowledge it and say, okay, God, we're going. Those connected with our schools and sanitariums are to labor with earnest alacrity. That means cheerfulness and eagerness. The work that is done under the ministration of the Holy Spirit out of love for God and for humanity will bear the divine signature and God will make its, and will make its impression on human minds. You know why? <laughs> Every single one of us, God wants to write a signature on us. He's going to give us a new name. That's going to be God's signature on us for all eternity. But I tell you what, when you're trying to do something with a group, when you're trying to follow God in your personal life, It'd be awfully nice if you thought you were hearing God's voice and you started processing it. And when that happens, you know, when, when I think God's doing something, someone brings a good idea to me or God lays an idea in my mind, I start praying about it. And if I think that it's gaining momentum, if I think God is seeding my mind with encouragement and affirmation, I'll share it with somebody else. And if he, if he seeds it even more, then I'll share it with somebody else that I trust. And pretty soon it's like, I think God's doing something here. And I want to tell you, when you process something like that and it works its way out through fellow pastors and elders and a board and a group of, a, a, a group of elders, and when you finally bring it to a business meeting and you have what happened, what happened here, where we had a unanimous, anonymous vote, you could have, any one person out of the hundred and almost 50 people that were here could have just written no on their piece of paper, but nobody did that. Yes, I'm talking about moving forward with our media, medical and student-focused ministry through the purchase of this property next to us here. I have never in my whole life run a business meeting. Most of the board meetings that I work with are almost always unanimous yes votes, but in 30 plus years of ministry, I've never had a unanimous yet business meeting vote. Because all you have to do to be in a business meeting is get out of bed on the day of the business meeting and show up. You don't have to come to church. You don't have to read your Bible. You just need your name written on the books of the Seventh-day Adventist Church you're a member of. And I, I've, it's, I've watched people who are the most negative people in the world. They don't even come to church, but if they hear there's a business meeting, they'll show up. <laughs> the divine signature. I'll read you another quote. My brethren, the Lord calls for unity and for oneness. We're to be one in the faith. I want to tell you that when the gospel ministers and our medical missionary workers are not united, there's placed on our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. Now listen. She uses this phrase very limited. She only uses this phrase for two situations. The worst evil. When a parent practices so-called tenderness, coaxing and indulgence towards the youth, she says, this is the worst evil that can come upon them. So there's a worst evil from the home, that's a parent who doesn't know how to rightly use love and authority, and there's a worst evil on the church, that's when the doctors and the pastors aren't united. You study it. Now, we've got some worst evils that are working against us. But we also have the call from heaven right now to move forward. And I believe where God is doing it and how he's doing it is right here. So on Wednesday night, two and a half weeks ago, we had a, a meeting and I went over with anybody that wanted to what the Saturday night board meeting was going to be about. And the next day in the afternoon, I invited our online members to zoom in and to know what the meeting was going to be about. When that online meeting ended... Just before it ended, one of the online viewers texted me and said, I'll put a check in the mail tomorrow or as soon as possible for $5,000 and more will come. Now, the project hadn't even been voted yet. Saturday night, we come up to the meeting and there's not one negative thing said. Now, I have no problem with iron sharpening iron. I really believe we've got to look at everything from both sides. 
But there was the sweetest, most beautiful spirit about that meeting. And when it was all said and done, everybody in the privacy with their own pen and their own piece of paper wrote yes on the ballot. At the end of that meeting, someone walked up to me and I stepped to the edge of this and they handed me a tithe envelope. I didn't look at it that night. I do have a right to look at tithe envelopes and people's financial habits. I actually have an obligation to talk with people who are not returning to God his money and they're robbing him. Not a very pleasant part of a minister's job. But I want to tell you, I decided to have a look at it the next day and the 5000 from the online viewer was matched by $5,000 from the person who handed me the tithe envelope that night. Two weeks ago, just a little bit less, somebody called this church, and they wanted to find out some information. It's a very busy office here, and our secretary was busy, so the phone call rolled over to our treasurer. And the treasurer talked the person out of coming to church that weekend and coming to the weekend we just celebrated, the right arm of the gospel. Now, mind you, the person was calling because they were a part of our online ministry and our media team had created connection for them, our AV team as well. They came to the meeting. They had not planned on coming to the meeting. And they said to me in the midst of one of the meetings, in between, the lady asked me a question or two and she said, well, We like to fund operations. And I said to her, well, we don't have any operations to fund. I mean, it's the village church's job to take care of village. Amen? I'm going to say that again. It's the village church's job to take care of village. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Are you returning an honest tithe? Are you giving a generous offering? We practice systematic benevolence here. The combined budget offering? We believe that Systematic benevolence is how we keep going. So about 5 or 6% of your offering to combined budget, 2% to Michigan Advanced Partners, and 2% to the world budget. If that's not what you're doing, make it your goal. Back when I was a student here making $400 a month, I returned 5% of my income to the Lord. When I got a real job, I started returning 10. And since then, we've done a little bit more. The Hebrews returned 25% of their income to the Lord. You can't rob God and live a rich life. It's our job to take care of village. And so when this person said, we like to fund operations, I said, well, we don't have any operations to fund. We come up through the end of the weekend, and I have the final thoughts over at the Reviving the Right Arm Gospel in the cafeteria in our uh, fellowship hall. And afterwards, the same woman, now with her husband, said, can we go over and look at the property? I said, sure, go ahead and and look. I said, if there's a car in the driveway and they say something, just say you're from the church. So they went over and they peeked in the windows. They came back and they said, we're going to go to uh, Silver Beach. When we come back, could we visit with you? I said, yes, I've got to go take my wife over to school. She's a teacher. And so they texted me, we're leaving Silver Beach. We'll be back. I said, I'll be a little late, but I'll be there. We sat down in the committee room. They started talking to me and They were asking me all kinds of questions about Andrews University, how it was going there, and they started asking me questions about this medical clinic that we're going to start, and after a while, the man said, well, we're going to write you a check for $265,000. That'll get you halfway to where you need to go with what's left to raise. And he said to me, he said, we're a hundred years behind on this. I want that to settle in on you. If the worst evil is separating the doctors and the teachers, maybe the biggest blessing will be getting them back together. What do you say? Just like we were last weekend. Just like we were on Friday as I'm visiting with the Grand Rapids pastor and the Lansing pastor. Then he wanted to know about the Lake Union Revolving Fund. 
He said, how does that work? Because he had heard we were going to be prepared to borrow some money if we needed to. I said something along these lines. This is how it works. Because, you know, the Bible says not to charge usury from each other, interest. He was a little concerned we might be violating the Bible mandate. And I said, well, it kind of works like a bank. You put your money in there as a church, you get a little better interest than the bank will give you. And if you need to borrow, you get a little charge, a little bit less interest than the bank. He said, well, if you don't make it to your fundraising goal, I'll loan you the rest of the money at 0% interest. My treasurer told me the next day that $18,000 had come in online. And then a few days later, a lady walks under the pergola who's here to volunteer. She's one of our online members, and she hands me this. Does everybody know what this is? That's a sock. It'd be good for everybody to get a sock out between now and Christmas time. Black Friday's coming, and I'd encourage you not to make it black for your budget. There's money in there. But there's more than change. Oh. That's a check for $3,000. That's a nice sock offering. You know, Ellen White had a sock. And when they needed paper for the review, she had saved to the penny the exact amount that was in there. Don't tell me. We had an online viewer send us $25,000 sock offering. What about us? There's a 20-some-year-old young man that came by and saw me this week one of our members. He wanted to talk to me about his journey. He said, I've already got my number. I'm here to tell you between the services, he came and gave me his numbers. He's 20 some years old. He handed me 10 $100 bills. Then a little old lady came and saw me between the services. And she handed me this. The bottom line says one zero comma zero zero zero. Then I had my treasurer call me, text me between the services, and she said, Pastor, now listen, this is a treasurer. By the way, we have an exceptional treasurer. She said, Pastor, she didn't tell me this. <laughs> she said, Pastor, I emailed the conference on Thursday and told them we're not going to need their revolving fund note. And then I had an online viewer between the services text me and say, I have another $10,000 for you. And I just want to ask all of you listening, what's your number? At the end of the elders meeting, I met with the elders in the church board on Wednesday night. You know why I met with them? Because they're the leaders. And I wanted to know what they were going to do. And I didn't, I told them what I'm telling you right now, so they already know about this, but I said, what are you going to do? I don't want them to tell me what they're going to do. I don't even want you to tell me what you're going to do. It's between you and God. But he speaks loud enough to people who are listening, but I had one elder, it was about time to sing the doxology, and I had one elder say to me, Pastor, can I say something before you sing the doxology? I said, Yes. Now, I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He said, in my family, I'm the spender and she's the, she's the saver. I could ask for a show of hands to see how many men are spenders and women are savers. I think it might kind of reflect the general trend, although it's reversed sometimes. And they said to each other, you pray about your number and I'll pray about my number. And you know, when, when you're the spender, it sometimes means you're a little bit more of the giver too. And when you're the saver, it means you're a little bit less willing to give. And he said, we prayed about our number, and when we both revealed our number, my wife's number was twice as big as mine. I said, maybe you can share your testimony on Sabbath, but I only made it about three rows back when another elder caught me, and he said, Pastor. He said, I did the same thing he did. And in my family, it's the same way. I'm the spender and she's the saver. And he said her number was three times bigger than my number. Now I'm here to tell you, 
in my mind, there's a divine signature on reviving the medical missionary work. And it just might be that the privilege is for the village church to be a part of the consortium of churches that lead the way on reversing the worst evil and making the greatest blessing come back to what we're doing. Because our young people don't need to get great educations to go out to make great salaries without any great purpose. What they need is the greatest education of all that gets hand, heart, and head and weaponizes them against all the darkness and makes them a soldier in the army so that when the general puts on his puts on his armor and comes down and holds up the standard because there's a flood of evil coming in. They all listen to his voice and they fall into line and the church is like an army terrible with banners and like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we're treading where the church has trod. We are not divided, all one body. We one in faith and doctrine, one in charity and the world knows through the harmony and the focus and the unselfishness and the commitment and the clear presence of God in our midst that something is going on. This is where the church is at. And I have no doubt that between the 20-somethings and the little older women in Israel, between the sock offerings and the sacrifices that we make, if we really need to take anybody up on an offering, by the time we need to pay for the four acres next to us, which are set aside for medical ministry, media ministry, youth ministry, educational ministry. We don't know what God's going to do with it, but I know this. I don't want to be left behind when the divine army starts marching and the gates of hell are being beat on. I want to be right there with Jesus because he's taking this church from victory to victory, and that's what I've been waiting for for a long time. It's time God's moving. You get to decide if you're getting on the gospel train. You get to decide what you're going to do. But I don't plan to call up the man who had his wife write the $265,000 and say, well, it hasn't worked out too good here. Could we borrow some at 0% interest? Listen. The way doesn't open up till you start moving. This was almost a million dollars. I didn't know how it was going to move. I thought, Lord, where are we going to get all that money? <laughs> but I'll tell you what. He said he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I guess he went to one of the hills and brought in some cattle. <laughs> but I do know this. We're going to have harder times in front of us. That's why he's making this so easy. Listen to me. We're not in a straight place. We just have a big mountain to climb. After we all give our money, we're still going to have nice cars and decent houses. We're still going to have a decent Christmas. It's going to get straight somewhere along the line. We're going to come up to our own Red Sea. <laughs> and when that time comes, I don't want to be on the complainer's wagon. I want to be on the, the you know, what's the song say? This train is bound for glory. This train. <laughs> Cloud by day, fire by night, water out of the rock, manna on the ground. <laughs> I'm going home. Before I get there, I've got to learn some more faith. Ideally, I learn it with you. And ideally, we encourage the rest of the churches in the North American Division and the world to rally together to get the educators, the doctors, and the pastors lined up together so that we can weaponize everything we know in the gospel message to enlighten this world and as the glory of the Lord rises on us, the wealth of the Gentiles will come to us. That's what Isaiah says. It's happening. It's only going to happen more. Don't miss out. The song we're going to sing as a closing song spells it out. You may not be able to do this, but there is something you can do. So let's rise up and do it. Let's stand together. As